It's so good to see you. I know Rich just said it, but I'm going to say it again. Welcome here this morning. And if you are a first-time visitor, first-time guest here, a special welcome to you. And uh, let's give them a hand, because I know there's a few of them in the house today. And if it's your hundredth or thousandth time here, uh, we are actually equally glad that you have come back, that you're here over and over again. And so welcome. God bless you today. We are excited to continue in this series called The Fight. I don't know about you, but I've been feeling it. I've been feeling like I'm in a battle. I mean, I think as believers, we know that we're always in a battle, but I don't know if I've ever felt the battle as presently as in your face as I have the last little while. Um, a battle for our faith, a battle to stand. It's a battle sometimes just to keep going, isn't it? Just to wake up in the morning and kind of do the things that we need to do. Sometimes it feels like a battle and we're in a fight. And today we're gonna be talking about taking our stand. How do you take your stand? in your fight. My stand might look different than your stand, but one thing that is certain at some point in our lives, we will be called to take a stand if we're believers, at some point. And sometimes I think we underestimate how important it is to be ready when that time comes and what it's going to take when that time comes. So today we're going to be talking about the faithful, that's you, me, we hope, right? We pray that we will be found faithful. We're going to be talking about the faithful and the future, because the faithful and the future are in God's hands. There have been, well, there's been this pandemic that has rocked our worlds. There have been riots worldwide. There have been floods. There are fires. There are all kinds of things, political unrest, economic instability going on all around us, and it's always so. But I'm not sure if it's ever felt like it's been erupting all around us with such increasing frequency and intensity. Have you noticed that? For those of you who have lived a minute, you've noticed it wasn't always like this. Some will call it the judgment of God. This is judgment. This is because of the way the world is going sideways. Some people will call it the natural processes of living in a fallen world a broken, fallen world that we've been in since the fall of Adam and Eve. And some would call it the sinister plans of humanity, the proof that there are people that are just too willing to cooperate with the evil one in our world, and the evil one is scheming and planning for our destruction. That's a reality that we believe in. So what is it? Well, one day we'll know. For now, I wonder, I watch, and I pray, and I wait. Because at some point, there's going to be a time where I'm going to have to make a choice. I'm going to have to make a stand. And perhaps it'll become more clear when that time comes. But for now, we have a job to do. For now, we're in a battle. For now, we need to be armed and we need to be ready. Paul gives a command to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.11. In the New Living Translation, it says it like this. But you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. And what the evil things were he was talking about just before that were basically materialism. Uh, searching after wealth, trying to make your life comfortable, and focusing all your energy on material things. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And then he says this. This is like the, the, the one we always remember, right? Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you, which you have declared well before so many witnesses. And I charge you before God, who gives life to all, and before Christ Jesus, who gave a good testimony before Pontius Pilate, that you obey this command without wavering. What command? Fight the good fight for the true faith and hold on to your eternal life. This is the command. 
Fight the good fight for the true faith and hold on. Don't let go. Don't let go of your testimony. Don't let go of what you have heard and accepted. Fight the true fight for your faith by holding on to that which you believe. So obey this command without wavering and then no one can find fault with you from now on until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? That's the good news. That's going to happen. But until then, Timothy, fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold on to what you've been taught. Hold on to what you believe for dear life. And don't let go until Jesus comes back. And then in Ephesians, Paul writes, Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10, Paul writes this, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you will be able to, what? Stand firm. Didn't say put on all of the armor of God so you can get ready and go screaming and roaring against your enemies. It says put on all of the armor so you can stand. So that when the fiery darts, the arrows of the enemy come at you, They might knock you a little bit, but they're not going to knock you right over. They're not going to pierce your armor. It's not going to be a fatal blow. You are going to take some blows. And if you don't have armor on, they may be fatal. And you may, may lose the hope that you have. You may come unhinged and waver in your faith. But if you're armed, when those arrows come, not if, when they come you can still stand. We are called to stand. So it says, you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist resist. Mm. We're talking defensive here. We're talking about being able to stand. We're talking about being able to resist, to not fall for everything, to not fall on our faces, not to stumble in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground like he didn't think we would get it. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. And then it goes on to list all of the things that we need to have as believers, truth around our waist and a breastplate of righteousness, holiness, right standing with God, salvation on our head, the gospel of peace on our feet, and the sword, the word of God in our hands. And like Pastor Rich said last week, the only offensive weapon in that whole getup, the only thing offensive that we have is the word of God. That we wield. That we put out there. But everything else is simply to allow us today to stand, to resist, and to stand. And sometimes taking a stand, standing firm, is the hardest thing to do. It's counterintuitive, and you see it everywhere. It's why people are nasty everywhere. Have you been on social media? Everybody's using it as their soapbox to put their political views, to put their views on vaccines, to put their views on masks, to put their views on their best friend's brother who did who knows what. It's the place we air our dirty laundry, a lot of us. We're attacking. A lot of us are attacking, and you know why we're attacking? Because we're in a weird place. Everything is going on crazy all around us and we know it. And so what happens to us? We get into fight or flight. We've talked about this before. We get into fight or flight. What does fight look like? Fight looks like attack. I'm scared. I'm insecure. I don't know about my job. I haven't seen my friends. I haven't been able to worship with believers. My spiritual life isn't going so good because I haven't been reading my Bible because I have no accountability. My life is falling apart, and I'm scared, so I'm fighting. I'm putting my views out there, and I'm tearing down people who don't like them, and I'm making other people feel scared. 
and I'm rude and I'm nasty when I'm out and I'm nervous, that's fight. That's why people seem sometimes like they're going crazy. Because when we get insecure and scared, when things seem uncertain around us, we go into fight or flight. And that's the fight. And some of us go into flight, right? They're the ones we haven't heard from in a year and a half. They're the ones who cut everybody out. They're the ones who don't want to go out. They're just hiding. They're hiding. But standing, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Like, just stand there. Don't attack and don't run away. Just stand. And that seems to be what we're called to do, you and me. We're called to stand. We're called to not be afraid and to attack and go on the offensive when, when we feel that urge, that natural urge to fight or flee. We're not to flee. We're not to run away. We're to stand, to stand firm, to resist. It's going to take the Holy Spirit because it's not our nature. Our nature is fight or flight. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, being armed, being covered, we can stand. At the beginning of the month, we were at the lake uh, for a lovely time away. And um, we were visited by a very dark and furry guest. Um, Apparently, maybe it's because the American hunters haven't been up here, or the drought, and there's not a lot of berries. I don't know, but the bears are everywhere. So we had more than one bear encounter uh, at our time at the lake, and that was fun. Um, Been going there 24 years and never seen a bear there before. It's a long story. I'm not going to share it all with you. But when when everything reached a climax on the third day that we knew the bear was around, we were sitting out in the evening after dinner, and the bear started coming toward us. And as soon as I saw the bear, that fight-and-flight thing, started going like this, I'm a mama, all my babies are here, the dog is here, what's Rich going to do? My father-in-law went into action mode, and he actually took care of the bear. We didn't have to do anything, but that, that second or two when I saw the bear, before I just relented and, and decided I didn't need to do anything, I sensed that, okay, what am I going to grab? right? The binos look pretty good. I'm going to hit him with the binos across the nose if he gets too close. Or, or maybe I should just make for the cabin, right? Maybe I should hide. Maybe I should fight. Maybe I should flee. But you feel that, right? Just imagine the bear's coming, right? Standing there and doing nothing is probably not the first thing that comes to your mind, is it? We're thinking about how we could fight or how we could flee. So with all of this going around, I've just been feeling like, man, we've really got to look at the word and see what the word says to do. Easy enough to say, okay, stand. Easy enough to say, okay, got the salvation, got the truth, got the word of God, but now what? What about for all these situations? What's this going to look like? And what popped into my mind was Daniel. What popped into my mind was Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael. And if you're not familiar with those names, those are the real, true Hebrew names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I think if we look at Daniel chapter 1 today, we'll find and learn some really important things. So we're going to look at Daniel 1. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name, prepared to look at your word to see what you have to say about standing firm. In a time just like this, we thank you for Daniel We thank you for your word, and we pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word, your instruction, and help us to apply it to our lives today. Because as Christ followers, Lord, we know that fighting often will not be the way, that fleeing often will not be the way, but Lord, standing firm is likely what you are calling us to in this hour. But Lord, we're going to need the wisdom to know the difference, and so we pray that you would teach us from your word today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Okay, so hang on tight. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 1 in the New Living Translation. Are you ready? You might want to, it's probably long enough to be worth it to get out your phone or open up your Bibles, and you might want to track with me, because actually I'm going to be coming back to a few key verses throughout Daniel chapter 1. So if you have it and you want to leave it open, 
that would probably be a brilliant idea. Here we go. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace of the, of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen from all of the tribe of Judah. They weren't the only ones. They were four. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined, say determined. Oh, say it like you mean it. Not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff. He didn't give up. He talked to the chief of staff. He wasn't too sure. So then he talked to the next guy down. He talked to the attendant who had been appointed to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. Don't take my word for it. Let's test and see. At the end of, oh, so then the attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished. Some translations say fatter. That might make you reconsider the Daniel diet, hey, for a a fast. Uh, Better and healthier, better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave. Can you say that? God gave. God gave these these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. And when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed them impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter, requiring wisdom and balanced judgment. Okay, right now, Lord Jesus, this is my prayer. That we would have wisdom and balanced judgment. If the world needs anything right now, my friends, especially from Christ followers, it is not a fight response It is not a flight response, but it is a response filled with the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom and balanced judgment. Amen? He found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. They were blessed. They had gotten juicy on vegetables and water. This is a miracle. This is not a natural thing. This is a miraculous thing. They had favor, more favor. They had aptitude. This wasn't natural. It was God's favor resting on them. They started off well. They started off smart and good looking, but they are thriving here under the favor of God. They were faithful 
and God had a plan, and God had their future. Do you believe that God is faithful? Do you desire to be faithful? Do you believe that God has your future? Amen. He does. We are in troubling times. And let's face it, Daniel and his four friends and all of the exiles were in troubled times. They had been kicked out of their homeland. They had been, they're they're in a brand new world, essentially. Culture shock. They are forcibly taken, right, out of their homes. They are forcibly taken into this training program for three years. They are taught a new language. They are given new clothes to wear. They are taught a new religion. They are given new names. This is indoctrination. This is forced assimilation. This is not pleasant. They are in a tough spot, tougher than we are. I mean, we're in a tough spot, I would say. I think that's a fair assessment. Our world is changing. It's getting tougher to stand for truth. It's getting tougher to live according to the way that God wants us to live. But we're not here. So we're going to look at how Daniel and his friends did it. How did they do it? And maybe you feel, I'm hoping that you feel like you can relate to Daniel. Daniel was renamed Belteshazzar, which means Bel was a Babylonian god, the chief Babylonian god, and it means God protect his life. Bel protect his life. Um, Originally, Daniel means God is my judge, and his name is now Bel protect his life. Hananiah, which means God shows grace, was changed to Shadrach, which means under the command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael, which means who is like God, was renamed Meshach, which means who is like Aku, the moon god. Azariah, which means the Lord helps, is changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nebu, the god of learning. So these Hebrew young men were named after their god, the god of Israel, their lord. And when they are renamed, they are renamed after the moon god and the god of learning and the chief god of the Babylonian culture. I don't think that probably sat too well with them. But one thing that's very interesting to note is that we don't see Daniel and his friends rebelling. We don't see them kicking and screaming. We don't see them defiant. We see them actually going along and accepting these uncomfortable things for a while. To a point where they had to draw a line in the sand, and then we see things change, right? And I think that's what, what, what it, it is, is for us. It's, we're in this uncomfortable spot that it's like, okay, how long, God? What do I take? What do I absorb? How long do I go along? And where do I draw a line in the sand? And when I do draw that line, what do I do? How do I respond? And that's why Daniel is so important for us. In our day and age, you're not going to be given a new legal name likely, but you might be given labels and titles. You might be called intolerant. You might be called a prude. You might be called a loser for one of the things that you decide that you need to stand up for. When I was 12 years old, in the hallway of my junior high, one very foolish young boy called me a Jesus freak. And inwardly, I kind of chuckled, but I was very unsanctified. And so my ego rose up and I threw him into the lockers. <laughs> but I was kind of happy that he called me a Jesus freak, but I had my reputation to protect. When I got older and I had my first job, an older woman, a colleague that I worked with, called me a Bible thumper. And, uh, you know, she didn't call me that every day. She didn't say, hey, Bible thumper, but, you know, it was something that she called me. And by then, I had grown in the Lord a little bit, and I didn't throw her into the lockers. Um, But I, I just remembered thinking, man, how I respond in this moment is probably pretty important. And I just smile. I didn't know what to say. It's like, yep, sure am. Holy roller. Come to church with me Sunday. Um... But sometimes we'll take a name. 
Sometimes we'll take a label when we make a stand. And we need to decide if that's okay or if that's something worth fighting for. There's three things that we can learn about taking a stand from this passage that we just read in Daniel 1. And the first thing is this, that God is in control of suffering. God is in control of our suffering. He's in control of the label you get and the name you get. He's in control of the situation that you find yourself in. And this can be prickly. This can hurt a little bit because sometimes we find ourselves in really ugly situations. But I believe Daniel 1 shows us that God really is in control of these situations. And we wrestle with this. We wrestle with the theology of how can God be good and allow bad things to happen. And it's a hard one. It's not an easy one. We don't always understand it. But look at what Daniel 1 says. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. King Nebuchadnezzar came to Babylon. He besieged it. He took control of God's city. Verse 2 says this. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah. Makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? The Lord gave the foreign king victory over the king of Israel. What? God is in control of suffering. God is sovereign. God has a plan. And we don't always have to like it, my friends. It reminds me of um, my kids. I remember um, meeting out some kind of discipline for my children at one point. And one of, it was one of the older kids because it was a long time ago. And they're like, I hate you. You're not my friend. And I looked at them and I said, I'm not supposed to be your friend, honey. I'm your mama. And you don't have to like what I'm doing because I see this situation differently than you and I understand what allowing you to do this thing that you want to do and have this look this way. I understand that that's not good for you and you can hate me and you can kick and scream and you can wish I wasn't your mom but I'm still going to do it because I love you and in the end it's good for you. And I feel like sometimes we see God that way. We want God to do what we want. We want him to be loving and gracious all the time. And by that I mean we want him to give us what we want. Don't we? We want it easy. and We want it comfortable. And we want it predictable. And we want it to always make sense. And so sometimes we hate God. Sometimes we kick and scream against him. Many people who don't want to follow God, that's their, that's their big reason. It's because of the bad things that happen in the world. I can't follow a God that would allow something bad to happen. And we all have to decide, do we trust him enough to believe that even when things aren't great or they're downright ugly, he's still in control and he has a plan For this particular instance, we can look to Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, there's a beautiful chapter about if you follow me and if you obey my commands, I will bless you. You will be blessed in the city. You will be blessed in the field. You will be blessed when you come and you will be blessed when you go and you will, you will always be the head and never the tail. And there's like 14 verses of this beautiful promise of God for what he will do for Israel if they follow him. And then there's like another 20 verses about the awful atrocities that will happen if they turn away from God and follow other gods. Awful atrocities. And they all happen. Some of them happen in this time with Daniel, and some of them won't happen until 70 AD and the Roman occupation and the destruction of the temple. But it happens, and it's nasty. And God told them that because Israel was supposed to be the nation that people look to. These are the people of God, and he is with them, and this is how they live right. But he's like, I can't bless you if you're not living right, and I can't bless you if you're not worshiping me. If you're following Aku the moon god, I can't keep blessing you because then everybody, the whole world, will think it's Aku the moon god. 
They have to know that it's me, the Almighty, the one true God. And so over and over and over in Israel, we see this cycle of prosperity because they follow God, and then there is disobedience, and then there is crisis, and then there is repentance, and then there is restoration. Prosperity, disobedience, crisis, repentance, restoration, over and over again. And here in Babylon, this is what we see. We see God giving over Israel to Babylon because they have walked away from God. When we wrestle with this, we wrestle with the sovereignty of God, and we have to realize that we can trust God to be in control of suffering because he is also good. He is good all the time, even when he gives Israel over to Babylon. He has a plan. The things that he allows are restorative. They are not punitive. We need to remember that in Christ, he has taken all of our punishment. We do not have to bear the burden of our punishment. We may suffer consequences, but the things that we, that we go through, sometimes God is using to shape us. We cannot always have ease and turn out to be really nice human beings. Every ounce of compassion that I have has come from me going through something gross. Every ounce of empathy that I have as a human being is because I went through something painful. And so I can look at another human being and empathize and feel and have compassion for them. God will use your mess, right? This is so cheesy. God will use your mess to be your message, your test to be your testimony. But it's true. If you never go through anything, be loved. To make no mistake, God loves you. But if you never go through anything hard, how will you ever have wisdom and balanced judgment and anything to offer others who are going through something hard? We have to remember that God is both sovereign and he is good. The Bible says that God disciplines those he loves. Why? To wake us up so we don't keep going down the wrong path path. He is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So when we start going sideways, he might wake us up, not to hurt us, not to harm us, to wake us up, to bring us back so that we're alert, so that we're standing, so that we don't get knocked down fatally. Number two is this. The second thing we can learn from Daniel chapter 1 and from Daniel and these four Hebrew children, young men, is that you are responsible for your stand. God is in control of suffering. He is sovereign over everything that happens. You don't have to worry about who's president in the United States. Pray about it, but don't worry about it. Pray about what's going on in healthcare, absolutely, but don't worry about it. God is in control over suffering, but you are responsible to stand. That's your choice. That's your responsibility. It says this in verse 8, Daniel was determined. He was determined. He was resolved. He had fixed in his heart. He had decided. He had made up his mind. He had determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. Now, I don't know. Was it unclean food and it violated their kosher laws? Very possibly. Was there something else going on there? Very possibly. I don't know. But he had decided that this is where I draw my line in the sand. For him, this was a bigger deal than getting a new name, learning about their gods, wearing different clothes. That stuff wasn't worth fighting for, but this was. So he determined not to defile himself. And I love that he didn't rebel. I love that he didn't get nasty. But he requested. He went through the proper channels. He asked the big guy. The big guy said no. He asked the little guy. The little guy said, okay, we'll, we'll play this game of yours and we'll see what happens. He didn't get nasty. He didn't get ugly. He played by the rules. He was respectful, and he requested so as not to compromise. What would it look like for you to take your stand? To keep your connection 
with God in these times, to not let go of eternal life for anything. Maybe it looks like, you know, you've got a lot of friends with a lot of different beliefs. Maybe it looks like I'm going to need to limit my time with this person and this person because their views are so different and they're always talking to me about my beliefs. And, you know, I just know that if I spend too much time with them, it's going to wear me down. I'm going to stay their friend, but I've got to put a line in the sand. I'm not going to spend more than whatever. I'm not going not to spend more than a couple hours a week with them because I can feel them wearing me down. You have friends that aren't believers? Great. But maybe your line in the sand is, I will not date someone. I will not date someone who does not know God. Because I don't want to get caught in that trap. I don't want my heart to get too involved and have it get ugly, have it get difficult. Maybe it looks like I'm going to prepare my testimony. I'm going to prepare a few scriptures that are really important to me so that when I have an opportunity, I can share it. I'm ready. Maybe that's where my line in the sand is. In a certain situation, I know what to say. I'm going to get ready now so that I know what to say when this topic comes up. What's your line in the sand? In 1955, a young lady named Rosa Parks was riding on a bus. She was sitting at the back of the bus where she was supposed to sit because she was black. And the bus was full, and some white people got on the bus, and she was sitting where she was supposed to sit, And the bus driver called for people at the back of the bus to get up to let white people sit in the back of the bus. And Rosa Parks decided that enough was enough. Rosa Parks decided, I'm tired of this. This is my line in the sand. I'm done. I'm not doing this. For her, taking her stand meant keeping her seat. That's what it looked like for Rosa Parks. Because she had had it. She was tired. And for her, it was important enough to take a stand. I'm sure in her mind, she was counting the cost. I'm sure as she refused to stand, she was thinking, what are they going to do? Are they going to physically throw me off the bus? Are they going to arrest me? Is it worth it? She decided it was. So she took a stand, and she was arrested. And... uh, People went and saw Martin Luther King, and he got involved, and and really it was an event that sparked media coverage and really a revolution, because Rosa Parks took a stand for what she believed in. And I don't think it's okay as believers to go looking for a fight. But when the fight finds you, We need to be ready to stand. So Daniel fixed his heart. He was determined. Number three is that God is in control over your success. He gets the credit for the good stuff too. In Daniel chapter 1, we see God's favor. It says in verse 9, Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. God. God did that. Who did it? Yeah. God gave them favor. They were doing good. They were being faithful, but it was God who gave them favor. And he, was, he gave them unusual skill. It says God gave these four young men unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams unusual skill. Who gave them that? God. According to scripture, God gave them favor. God gave them unusual skill. He is with you. He has the faithful in his hands. Your suffering, your successes, But it's up to you, it's up to me, to take our stand. To be armed so that we can take the stand without it knocking us out. To be ready to stand. To have settled and determined in our own hearts and minds where our line is. 
so that when that time comes, it's not going to knock us off our feet. It's not going to catch us off guard. We're ready. Here's the good news. The good news is this, that in a culture that was so contrary to God, in a culture that was so opposite of the ways of God, Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael for 70 years, 7-0, for 70 years, they were faithful. For 70 years, they took their stand. We're going to talk next week about another time they took their stand. Over and over again. And they risk their literal lives to do it. They literally risk their lives. Over and over. But God's in control of suffering. <laughs> and God's in control of success. And the only part here that we really have to concern ourselves with is counting the cost and being determined and resolved to take our stand. When the fight comes, we don't have to go looking for it. Believe me, it's going to find us. One day or another day, right? It's going to find us. But we need to be ready to take our stand so that when the fight comes to us, we can. Because that is when we will see the favor of God. That is when we will see him come through. That is when we will be counted as faithful. He didn't do it with rebellion. He didn't do it with defiance. He used wisdom and balanced judgment. It's in such short supply. If we could just be like Daniel in 2021 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, or wherever you find yourselves, that would be good, wouldn't it? Don't you want to be like Daniel? Man, I do. And we're going to learn a little bit more about Daniel and, and some of the amazing things that he did with the help of God. But if we could rise up for a time such as this and be Daniels, and if we could rise up in a time such as this and be Esthers, maybe the world will see that God really is the one true God that he is alive, that he is working, that he is moving, that he is sovereign. Amen? Would you stand with me? It's funny that Pastor Rich was talking about giving God your yes, because that's what I put in my notes. I remember a day where... Uh, Pastor Trevor at Calvary Temple gave an altar call and he said this. He said, are you willing to give God your yes before you know the question? And that's my question to you today. Are you willing to give God your yes? So that when you have done all to stand, stand firm, therefore armed and ready, trusting that you're in God's hands. Father, we come to you today just so thankful for your word, thankful for Daniel, thankful for Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, and, and just the example that they are for us. We ask for your favor on our lives. We ask for your blessing on our lives. We submit to what you want to do even if there's some suffering involved. We submit and give you our yes, even though we know there will be a cost. Nothing good is free. Except what Jesus did on the cross. So we accept salvation, we accept grace, we accept your favor with gratitude and thanksgiving. And we ask you to help us be faithful in a time such as this. We ask you to help us be faithful. Give us strength to stand. Give us what we need in our individual circumstances at our job and in our homes and with our neighbors and wherever we find ourselves, Lord, we need you to stand. 
And we trust that as we take our stand, that you are in control of everything else. So we yield to you. We give you our yes. And we thank you for what you have already done and what you are going to do, what you are able to do through a people who are determined and resolved and committed to follow you, no matter what that may look like. We thank you for your word that says anyone who gives up family or homes or wealth, you will reward them for what we give up in this life. You will reward us in eternity. We thank you for that promise so we can look at laying things down and not worry, but even be excited about it because you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. We love you, Lord. You are so good. No matter what it looks like all around us, you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. If any of you are watching online and or, or are here today in person and you have not made the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would just invite you to do that right now. You can just pray this prayer with me to accept Christ. We believe that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, we will be saved. And you're, you're immediately at peace with God. You are justified by grace alone. By the grace of God alone, your faith in him, you are justified. And your journey of sanctification and your relationship with just keeps on getting better. Right? It does. I promise. Not always easier, but definitely better. It keeps on getting better. So you can pray with me this prayer right now. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross. You can all pray with me. You can pray it again. It's okay. It'll help someone who's praying it for the first time. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done on the cross, for paying for my sin, for covering my debt. Thank you that I no longer have to be punished as I deserve I accept your grace. I know I need it. I have done so much stupid stuff. But you have forgiven me of it all. You have washed me clean of it. You have thrown it away and forgotten it. And now I am at peace with you because of the cross. And as Jesus rose from the dead, I know that I will be raised to new life as well. Right now in my spirit, I'll be given a new chapter. But in eternity, I will have new life in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Help me follow you. Holy Spirit, I receive you. Have your way. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We rejoice with you if you have accepted Christ today for the first time, or like Pastor Rich says, for the first time in a long time, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at info at Bethelwpg.com so we can get in touch with you, just help you on your journey, get you started. And uh, we are meeting in person, so you can register at Bethelwpg.com slash events. We would love to see you in person. For those of you who are here today, thank you so much for being with us.